Ladies and gentlemen, with the permission of the chair, the next presentation is on heartburn versus heart attack, how to evaluate and manage. I'd like to invite Professor Surendra Sankur Rao, who is the president, the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, and he currently serves as a senior consultant gastroenterologist at the St. Mary's Regional Medical Center and Integris Bass Baptist Health Center in Enid, Oklahoma, United States of America. For the next 12 minutes, uh, Professor Rao, please. Good morning. First, I want to thank Dr. H.K. Chopra, Dr. Naveen Nanda, H.K. Reddy and others who are uh, instrumental in giving me the opportunity to come here. This is a great uh, center with where you're mixing medicine with spirituality and it's a great experience to stay at this ashram. First, I want to have two disclaimers. One, I'm not a cardiologist, so you all can relax. But being a gastroenterologist, we interact with the same type of patients who have chest pain. Secondly, you'll see some of the slides, it'll say Rao Vitell. That's not me. There's another different Rao who did some work on it. Just to start off, I wanted to get a little cheer in the audience. So five of the doctors from Midwest went hunting. One was a family practitioner. Second guy was a psychiatrist. Third was an OBGYN. Fourth was a general surgeon. Fifth was a pathologist. They all go hunting and the ducks come up in the town. So they tell the family practice, go ahead and shoot. So he raises the gun and about to shoot, then he puts the gun down. Say, what happened? He's right in line. He said, I'm not sure it's a duck. So they keep going. The next guy is a, is a psychiatrist and his stand comes to shoot the duck and he's about to shoot. Then he drops the gun. He says, I'm, I can't do it. He said, why? I know it's a duck, but the duck know is it's a duck? So he doesn't do it. The third guy is OBGYN and he says, no problem, he, shoot, he, he picks up his gun and he's about to shoot and he drops off and says, what the hell happened to you? He says, well, I'm not sure that duck is pregnant, so I don't want to shoot it. At this time, the surgeon doesn't waste any time, lifts up his gun, shoots the bird, the bird drops and he tells the pathologist, go and check it out what it is. So, good morning. Now, we will start our, our session on chest pain, esophageal origin and non-cardiac chest pain. This is a very common symptom. If you take if the, this outpatient study of 900 patients on outpatient setting where, where looked for chest pain and they found out 50% of them were musculoskeletal etiology. The others, GI causes were between 10 and 20%. Stable angina was 10%, respiratory was 5%, and about 2 to 4% were acute ischemia or myocardial infarction. If you take across the community, all comers, 30 13% is secondary to esophageal origin. And the most common symptom is, well, first of all, I want to tell you also the, the impact is tremendous. As you can see, the annual cost in USA for just ruling out functional chest pain with uh, MI is about nine, I mean eight billion. Now, when we look at the cost basis, even after cardiac cath, as you can see here, chest pain, which has been incapacitating the person from work, we divide into three categories, and after doing, even after doing cath, then you have 47% is not still satisfied that if they, even they have a normal coronary arteries. They still have chest pain, they still stay home, miss work. So here is a group of patients we like to help and improve. What is the pathophysiology? We have several receptors in the esophagus, as you all know. Just to enumerate them, we have the chemo with the acid and bile receptors. We have mechanical receptor for spasms. Hypersensitivity will come to that where they will be uh, incapacitating pain and psychological. The typical, the typical symptoms of gastroenterology, GI reflux disorders are number one, dysphagia. Number two, heartburn, regurgitation, and chest pain. Chest pain can be exactly like uh, angina of cardiac origin. They will have mid-channel, right into the back, congested jaw, arm, I mean sweating, you cannot differentiate. If you want to err, you always err on the side of heart. Make sure that that is not the thing and then you can send it back to us. Then we also have problems with belching, choking on food, 
and Oro, uh, Oro Isafijal symptoms. One thing I wanted to tell you is global sensation. People may think there's a lump or something sitting in their throat, and that could be GI reflux. But however, I had one person who was a physician who came to me and said, you know, I don't have any problems with GI reflux, but I have this bubble sitting in my chest. And I said, is it chest or in the throat? He said, chest. I said, I've never heard any, you know, I've been in practice for 40 years. And I said, I think you better see a cardiologist. He immediately went to see a cardiologist. I had a cat down here, an inferior MI, with a bubble sitting in the mid-chest. He had no other symptoms. So he had no cardiac disease documented before. So it can be very tricky sometimes. Though so these are the typical symptoms that we come with, and then we can move on to the next is, the, we have the five causes of esophageal origin of chest pain. Number one, most important, is the gastroesophageal reflux disease. And this particular uh, f uh, symptom is, is, is occupies almost 50% of esophageal causes and is treatable and we need to recognize it. So some of these symptoms they come with is hoarseness, apart from chest pain, chronic cough, we got sore throat, wheezing, clearing throat, global sensation, spasm, and then dental erosions. And they'll come with somebody holding their chest sometimes. It, mostly it is postprandial, not necessary. You can have nighttime without any provocation or anxiety or any kind of stress can even evoke uh, a, 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 a retrocinal pain. And they are promptly relieved with antacids. Now, when you look at the pathophysiology of G reflux, there are some factors that we have to keep in mind. Number one is LES pressure. Lower esophageal sphincter pressure in these patients can be very low or they have transient uh, relaxation without any cause or intra-abdominal pressure where a patient is obese and presses on the stomach or you may have an outlet problem with a mild stricture it causes uh, uh, reflux. And of course, the most important among the, all of these other than G reflux is your uh, motility problem. If you don't have a clearing mechanism of the acid in the esophagus, they do have typical symptoms. Now, you have, uh, this is a typical example of a patient who comes in recurrent chest pain. The important thing is recurrent, long-standing, and you can be coming to the ER or doctor several times, the family history, obesity, and then you do hard workup is negative. So the next thing is you do endoscopy. This is a very classic uh, finding. Unfortunately, you don't see this in all the G reflux patients, probably about 8%. The rest of them is non-erosive esophagitis. But one thing is certain that if you have somebody with clinical, very uh, typical s s symptoms, and you do endoscopy, you don't find this, do a biopsy. And the biopsy does help you a lot, even though it's normal esophagus uh, mucosa. It'll show you that hypertrophy of basal cell, papillomatosis, and most important, neutrophils in the epithelial cells. The treatment. Treatment is rewarding. Most of these patients, as you know, that can be treated with PPIs. There are several of them in the market. They are really very responsive. You start off with a lower dose. You can double it or change it to a different PPI. The important thing to remember, of course, as cardiologists, you always think that they'll interact with, you know, Plavix. That's why they've come up with uh, either uh, Protonics, which is, um, uh, which is very effective and doesn't interfere, or you can use uh, Dexiland in those patients if you want to stay away from litigation stuff. H2 blockers are also effective, and you can use them as the first line of uh, treatment if you like. They're also effective in patients who are not responding to double, uh, twice a day therapy, use a bedtime H2 blocker. Sucralfate is a surface acting uh, substance that will coat the, uh, the lining of the esophagus and the stomach and prevent the acid from injuring. And antacids are also effective. So next is uh, non-GERD esophagitis. Couple of words on that, this is Patient may or may not have the typical history, he swallowed a pill or is having some other like AIDS or something. So when you scope this patient, it's very interesting that they will have, they, before that, they will have adenophagia as one of the most important features. They'll have, they take a pill, maybe tetracycline, potassium, etc., or non, uh, non steroidal but they don't drink enough water. A little sip of water, the pill sits there, 
Believe me, that's one of the most excruciating pain they come with. One history you can find it sometimes, it's not that easy. In endoscopy, you'll find the typical features. Also, we also like to hear about infections, candida. Candida is a very typical endoscopic finding. You do biopsy, you'll, fi you'll find the organism. And radiation, of course, causes a typical esophageal uh, irritation. So let's move on to the next one, eosinophilic Esoph esophagitis. This is an entity, is on the increase, maybe because we're recognizing more, but the first, the first time that somebody thought about it was 1970. However, nobody paid attention. In the, it is in the, in the 90s, they started looking at it, and then now it is a full-blown picture with its own uh, features and uh, endoscopic uh, findings as well as histo histological. As you know, that um, the, the short name for esophagitis uh, esoph uh, is EOS, not EE. Eruz esophagitis is EE. So the reason for that is chronic immune antigen mediated disease. It's, it's 30 to 80 percent associated with another etiology of uh, autoimmune disease, such as asthma, hay fever, atopic dermatitis, rhinitis, etc. Now, when you do a endoscopy on these patients, we see what is called a ring esophagus. You have typical rings going all the way. You may not see in everybody, but you may see that, or you may see a vertical furrows, or you might see mic white specks, very tiny specks. You biopsy, these are microabscesses, and they only contain esophils. And then you may get a stricture. These are the presentation of these, but when you do an endoscopy and do a biopsy of the mucosa in EO, uh, EOE, you'll get Esophils typically in the epithelial cell. That's a diagnostic hallmark. You will not see esophils in any other condition. Then it may be a combined disease. But this is very typical to see. Apart from that, you get basal cell hyperplasia and also you will get some papillomatosis. And there is associated IgE in about 40%. And peripheral esophilia is not a must for diagnosis, but you can get about 40% peripheral. The most important cause or the only cause is dietary. It's an antigen-mediated disease. There are many dietary items that you do this, but there are five major ones that you need to think of right away is wheat, milk, eggs, fish, and nuts. Now, how do you, you know, you can easily tell a patient, don't take wheat for two months and come back, see whether you can, you know, whether you're okay. It's very difficult, but some people do it. But the thing to do is a skin test. You can do the RAS test or you can do the skin scratch test and you get help in the diagnosis. Of course, the treatment is to avoid uh, the antigen even once you find out. Meantime, you can treat them with PPI, BID dosage. They do improve with PPI, but if they don't, then you have topical steroids twice a day, we'll get good response. This is a rewarding condition, but remember, some of them have strictures. You need to do endoscopy and dilatation. One thing you need to know is they are prone for perforation. So it is not like dilating a regular esophageal stricture. One more very important one is the motility disorders. These are a condition where you get very high, uh, high amplitude contractions are not, respond, uh, not in response to anything. It can be spontaneous or, for example, you have the four conditions where you will see achalasia, which is your uh, typical one where you have a radiologically, you'll see a huge dilated esophageal beak-like or you can do manometry, you'll find extreme high uh, pressure in the lower esophagus. It is treatable with either pneumatic dilatation or hellers or your botulism. The nutcracker esophagus, this is another condition where with esophageal manometry, you'll see 220 amplitude or higher. Diffuse spasms, anything about 30 in a disorderly fraction, and you do uh, a swallow test, you'll see what is called a rose bead or a corkscrew esophagus and hypertensive esophageal sphincter. So we'll go to the last one, is the functional heartburn or functional chest pain. I'll give you a brief history of a patient who comes in with this history where cardiac evaluation is negative, endoscopy evaluation is negative, and with treatment fail. And then in these patients, what they've done is they've treated with SSRI, and we'll go through it in a minute, and they did improve. But remember, these people keep coming back to the ER, back to your office, unless you take this into consideration, you will not help this patient. So, what is the criteria to diagnose uh, esophageal origin, psychological 
on psychological basis. This is a Rome criteria where you need to have three, at least three months of history, it does not have to be continuous, where they have the typical mid chest pain, but it's not a burning quality. So once you have that criteria, then you, you have to rule out all the other causes of esophageal origin, including motor disorders and gastroesophageal reflux. So based on this study, you can see that there is a, a, a study that came out that shows that they, they do have a good number of patients that can be diagnosed with this. And then they did the study where they put a balloon in the esophagus and slowly, gradually increased. They compared normals and they found out the perception of pain on a normal, they never see that at a lower level, they see very high sensitivity of pain with severe pain. So these are the patients who have what is called a hypersense to esophagus with the receptors. And this is where you can do a balloon test, thereby showing there is a visceral component and motor change is secondary to sensory dysfunction. So what is the rationale as adenosine is supposed to be the, if you use one of those antagonists, adenosine, they do respond to treatment. And then in conclusion, you have the functional chest pain where we have hypersensitivity, adenosine induced, um, uh, 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 whereas the adenosine cells are the neuromediator mediator and you can block it with uh, theophylline. Here is the study that shows the usage of theophylline, a double blind study was successful, it was published in the uh, American Journal of Gastroenterology, where you can see the one with theophylline have 58% uh, versus 6% improvement in placebo. In conclusion, functional chest pain, theophylline mediates, uh, ameliorate the chest pain, uh, effect may be mediated by uh, uh, adenosine receptor antagonist, and there's improvement in visceral pain. Therapeutic uh, maneuvers for visual pain are, okay, well, one forward. Anyway, these are the, some of the uh, modalities you can treat them. Now, this is the algorithm where you have somebody with chest pain, you first rule out cardiac, start the empirically anti-reflux anti, uh, therapy. If they improve, if they don't have the red signs, which is iron deficiency anemia, GI bleeding, weight loss, recurrent vomiting, then you go to endoscopy. Those that don't improve with the S2 blockers, you do manometry, and then you, you can divide them into two categories. <coughs> those that are, uh, those that are, here it is, those that are responsive to uh, GERD positive, GERD negative, then you have to consider hyper, uh, hypersensitivity with visceral, then you divide them into theophylline uh, uh, improved, theophylline non-improved, then they go to the third category, which is the functional, and then you treat them with psychotropic drugs. So some of the therapeutic options in one slide. First, of course, is the, is the proton pump inhibitors along with, as we discussed already, H2 blockers, sucralfate. The second option is patients with hyperanalgesia, then we treat, no, okay. The second hyperalgesia where you treat with Theophan and SSRI, and then, you know, I'll, I think that these are the five, uh, four modalities where you can treat, but is it enough? So those that are hyperosagia, theophylline, those with stress and anxiety, then you know you can treat them with uh, tricyclics like triazodone, mepramine, and you have serotonin. And then, of course, the spastic smooth muscle ones they treat with smooth muscle relaxant. So in a lighter vein before I finish, a lot of people eat hot chili peppers get heartburn and epigastric pain. I just have, we went through this already. So this is a slide that shows about hot peppers. And believe me or not, there is a unit. It's called the uh, Scotchwick Hot Pepper Units. They are measured. I wish I could get a better picture of this. But they, they measure the extent of these units to tell you the hotness. The one we eat green and red are only in the range of 100 to 200. And then we get up to the top which is called the Habanos, they are like uh, extremely high, like in the range of 200 plus. Whereas if you go and uh, get this pe pepper spray, you know, people use for defense, they are like two to five million units of this uh, index. So you can imagine what this pepper is. In so thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Professor Rao. Please have your seat. We'll come back to the discussion at the end of all the presentations.